So welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, Conservations on Species Credits. Uh, thanks for attending. And I, I do want to remind you to, uh, when you enter, please put yourself on mute uh, so we can give uh, Victoria the best um, experience possible here at Con Conservations, Conversations on Species Credits. So my name is Doug Bruggeman. I'm the, um, the sponsor of this series. I'm with Ecological Services and Markets. We specialize in developing incentive-based programs for sustainability. And at first, I want to start by thanking uh, my steering committee who helps me put this together. Uh, Greg DeYoung, Sarah Johnson, Donna Collier, and, and Craig Denisoff. And um, we've had a, a great start to the series. And um, so I came up with the idea to do the series after serving on the USGS Species Crediting Toolbox Committee and also being on the National Environmental Banking Association board member. So based on our past talks, I think you know, we've seen that there's a strong desire to scale these species crediting markets um, and a lot of lessons learned, a lot of things that can be improved. And I think with the new administration, there's gonna be an opportunity, opportunity for us to um, create some new guidance and you know, us coming together as a community would be a great way to get that discussion going so we can more effectively communicate um, how we can make these markets work better. They are so critical uh, moving forward. And um, so again, I wanna thank everybody for logging on. There's a mix of folks from um, the public sector and private sector, and I love that mix. And um, so today we have a talk from uh, Victoria Colangelo uh, talking about um, uh, credits transactions and um, in wetlands and species markets and so we're going to give Victoria a chance to give a, a, a talk for about 20 or 30 minutes and then hopefully we're going to create an organic experience on zoom we're going to try to have a discussion on zoom and so you know if you want to pose questions during Victoria's talk please do so in the comment section and uh, and pose the question to everyone in the comment section. And then we'll start by reading those, those, those questions. And then I'd ask you to, you know, find an opportunity and you can unmute yourself at that point and, and we can help have a discussion and ask your question live. And so we do record these sessions. Um, and so we record them and I put them on the, on the YouTube and I add them to our LinkedIn group on LinkedIn. So it'd be great to have you join LinkedIn uh, on that group. And I wanna thank Victoria again for doing this. And I tell you, we've had our record um, signups for this talk with Victoria. So, you know, if you wanna start um, a movement, I would recommend inviting Victoria to speak. Um, all right, so with that, I am going to, you know, how every time I have to figure this out. Um, I lost Victoria in the. Um, in the series here, there she is. All right, Victoria, I'm making you the host. And please take it away. Thank you so much and happy Earth Day to everyone. I am so honored and proud to be able to uh, talk with you all today. Um, I have a great relationship with everyone on the steering committee and know them uh, from many years past. And I'm so happy that Doug is uh, gracious enough to have me speak on this platform today about wetland mitigation and species conservation banking in Florida. So, a little bit about me. I have been in this mitigation banking industry since 2004. Uh, I was 21 years old and I was an intern and I've learned everything and anything um, uh, just by doing some research and growth and just teaching myself uh, everything and anything on wetland species and uh, all the different dynamics in between. Uh, I represent over 50,000 acres, which encompasses about 20 mitigation and conservation banks. 
This is my gorgeous family, my fiance, my two little girls, Briella, Lily, and Bella, his daughter, who's 15, and her best friend from Easter at our uh, brunch. So just wanted to share a little bit of me with you. Okay, so let's talk first about mitigation banks. This is um, a classic mitigation bank in Florida. It's called the Reedy Creek Mitigation Bank. It was permitted in the late 90s, and it's a, uh, a wonderful success story where the restoration activities have been um, phenomenal. And we're going to talk a little bit about wetland mitigation. So you may know, you may be a very seasoned professional. You may have no idea what a wetland bank is. So keep this as a refresher. We're going to just walk through it. A wetland mitigation bank is a protected parcel of land that is conserved and permanently managed in perpetuity. It has wetland and upland areas that have been preserved, restored, enhanced, or created for the purpose of providing compensation for unavoidable wetland offset within its geographic region. In exchange for this permanently protecting the land and managing it, the Army Corps of Engineers and the state agencies provide credits for the bank owners to sell. Now, permanent mitigation banks in Florida. There's approximately 87 federally approved banks, which you can find all in rivets. And then there's also approximately 120, 123 approved permanent banks throughout the state, which encompasses um, FDEP and the five different water management districts that permit on the state level for mitigation banking. And as you can see, we got about 41 federal pending approval um, as far as federal. I'm not sure about the state. I'm looking into that right now, pending state banks. Anyways, here's a map that was created last year and it has all the mitigation banks um, uh, that have been permitted by the state. And then these are all the banks that have been permitted by the federal. Uh, from Aricor. So you can kind of see um, the areas where there are no mitigation banks. And in these boxes uh, correspond to where these banks are because there were so many. Okay, so wetland mitigation banking. Uh, it's not just about preserving the land and putting a conservation easement on it. That's just one little step. The main uh, ingredients of how you get your mitigation credits is through the restoration. And that could be anywhere from restoring the hydrology back to its natural state with low water quality uh, crossings, removing the invasive species, planted native species, uh, doing prescribed fires, and different activities that will get the credits released. Now, as you may or may not know, uh, mitigation banks don't give you all of your credits all at once. You have a credit release schedule. And I'm gonna show you an example of such. So, Let's just say this is about an approximately 400 acre bank. They got one credit for every seven acres of preservation and restoration. But as you can see, they get 56.6 credits, but they don't get them all at once. They're only gonna get 8.4 in the beginning for filing that conservation easement and providing the short and the long-term financial assurances, which could be a hefty amount. So it is a huge investment on the front end. Then you get more credits as you do these activities, such as low water quality, uh, I'm sorry, low, low water crossings, uh, earth ditch blocks, you get another 14 credits. You can also do the invasive exotic removal, which gives you another 2.8 credits. Four months later, you create a planning plan, you come back out and you ask for another credit release. Now, these credit releases take some time with the agencies to be able to give the releases, but you need to show proof, um, either by aerials or they'll come out and do a site visit, that you are uh, in compliance with your permit and you are doing these activities. If you guys aren't on mute, please mute. I hear some background noise. Um, and then after that, all the activities, now you're in the interim success criteria. And every year will be maintained and monitored with reports show that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And hopefully all you can hear me. Okay. Wetland impact. All right. So basically we now have this mitigation bank. What do we do with it? What's it for? What can we do with it? Well, we sell wetland credits. 
I'm so sorry, but someone is not on mute. And it's very hard for me to talk, but I guess I can keep talking. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hi, Chris. It's Surreal Perez. Mr. Perez, will you push mute for me? Anyways, I'll keep talking. Hopefully, you can understand what I'm saying. So, with the wet, we know our, uh, our consumer uh, who we're selling these credits to that have wet. I don't know if I can concentrate with this. Can we Victoria, I think. As host, I think you could probably, um, I was trying to figure out what I could do here, but I, I'm no longer host. Oh, great, okay. So with, with, as host, you might be able to remove Mr. Perez. I'm sorry, I don't know what else to do because I can't see how to mute him. No, no, it's a process that's very difficult. For me, it's difficult, but it's difficult. Uh-oh, I just need to say it. I don't know. Okay, okay. You might want to send him a message. Here we go. I think I can figure it out. Hold on. What's his first name? I'm sorry. Surreal. S U R I E L. Oh, boy. Can you send him a message? I, I'm trying to do that now. But again, I'm not going to post anymore. Um, okay. <laughs> All right, give me two seconds. I think I figured it out. Ah! I did it. So, man, can be a man, I just say, you're going to go back. Okay, bien. Bye-bye. I think I did it. And I think he hung up anyway, so it might have worked out. Are we good? Yes. Look okay, sorry about that, everybody. A little technical difficulty. I, I see that happening more and more these days. Okay, so anyways, um, so we have this mitigation bank. Who is going to buy it, and how do they buy it, and how does that whole thing work? So um, someone calls me and says, I need to buy mitigation. How much is this going to cost me? And I say, hold on. I need a little bit of information before we get to that. Where is your property located? It's located in Orange City. Okay, well, I need a little bit more detail about that because the basin line goes right through Orange City, and I need to know if you're in this basin or this basin, and the pricing and the availability and the type of credits change dramatically. So that is the most important thing um, initially to find out which drainage basin, which watershed, which hot code that your project is located in. From there, we can identify which mitigation banks encompass that same service area, that same drainage basin. The other big uh, factor, of course, is acreage. How many acres or how many square feet are you impacting? Are you impacting one acre, 10 acres, 300 square feet? What is it? Of course, that's gonna determine how many credits you need. And then thirdly, what the most important other than location is the quality of your wetland impact. You, um, and we need to find out if it's a low quality wetland, average or high. And there's different parameters that will give you a score to show you how many credits you need per acre of impact. What is a mitigation credit? Mitigation credit is a standard unit of measure which represents the increase in ecological value resulting from the restoration, the enhancement, the preservation, or creation activities. The assessment and scoring for these three categories are one, location and landscape support, two, water environment, and three, community structure. So those three criteria will determine what your quality of your wetland is. And here in the state of Florida, we have something called UMAM that was adopted in 2005. UMAM stands for the Uniform Mitigation Assessment Methodology. And prior to UMAM, Florida used credits, uh, they were assessed as ratio or RAP. So you might need one credit per impact, you might need one and a half credits per impact, or you even might need two credits per impact. It was very subjective. So the agencies here in Florida, regulators said, let's have a more objective approach to how we score these credits. And so they came up with a multiplier between zero and one, and they said, okay, we're gonna multiply uh, the acreage times the score, and that will tell you how many credits you have to get. Um, so therefore, 
say low quality wetland might be a 0.3, average quality wetland might be a 0.6, high quality wetland might be a 0.8. And as you know, that can dramatically affect the pricing because if our bank is $100,000 of credit, if you got a low quality wetland, it's $40,000 an acre of impact. If you got a high quality wetland, it's $80,000 an acre of impact. So there's a wide range that I cannot help you with. You've got to get an environmental consultant and have a wetland delineation and have them do this UMAM score to determine how many credits you're gonna need. Then you come back to someone like me and you get the credits. All right, service area. So as you know, each mitigation or conservation bank has a geographic service area. And this is all determined on which watershed or basin or hot code that you're located in. In Florida, there are 86 different drainage basins throughout the five different water management, management districts. Therefore, there's 86 different opportunities for mitigation banks as far as location. Here are the five different water management districts throughout Florida. This is the St. John's River Water Management District, which encompasses 23 basins. As you can see, these um, uh, hashed out basins, they are nested. So if you're located in Basin 15, you also get Basin 14 because it's nested in Basin 15. Nested means that it's more environmentally sensitive than any other basin, and it has, the mitigation has to be kept in Basin. Now, if you're not a nested basin and there isn't a mitigation bank, you can go outside of the basin, but you have to provide a cumulative impact assessment to show that there is a no uh, net loss with performing the mitigation in another basin. Here we got SWIFMA, the Southwest Florida Water Management District. They have 16 different basins within their district. And um, don't know what else to say about that. <laughs> South Florida Water Management District, South Florida Water Management District has 32 basins. And South Florida is a little different because in the other districts, you might just get one basin, your location of your bank, you get that basin. South Florida, sometimes you might get two, three, maybe even more. Like I said, you'll have to perform that community, uh, cumulative impact analysis should you have a project that is using mitigation in another basin. It can be done. Um, they don't prefer it, but it can be done for sure, especially if there's not another option. The Suwannee River Water Management District has eight basins encompassing, and the Northwest Florida Water Management District, they have seven basins. So all, those are all the different basins in Florida that determine service areas for mitigation banks. Now, let's talk about species mitigation. Um, I'm sure you all are aware of the guidelines and the different parameters in your specific state. Um, I am uh, knowledgeable on the Florida market, so that is what I'm talking about today. In Florida, uh, our state animal is the Florida panther. Uh, they, we do do conservation um, for the uh, panther as far as mitigation. There is only three species in Florida that have conservation banks. The panther is one of them. The sand skink is another one. And the Florida scrub jay is the third. The Florida panther, there's only about 100 to 200 Florida panthers left in Florida. And they're all around the Naples, Collier, Southwest Florida um, area. What is a habitat conservation bank? A habitat conservation bank is a protected parcel of land that is considered, or I'm sorry, conserved and permanently managed for species that are endangered or threatened. In exchange for this permanently protecting the land and managing it for these species, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife approves a specific number of habitat or species credits that the bank owners can sell. Now, unlike mitigation banks, you get all of your credits at once for a conservation bank. So if you have a 100 acre bank, you might get 100 credits as soon as it's permitted. Currently, there's about 15 permanent conservation banks throughout the whole state of Florida, uh, encompassing panther, sand skink, and scrub jay. And from what I can see on ribbits, there's only one pending conservation bank, which is a panther currently. Okay, so, the wetlands, we understand. We had a UMAM score. I need a 0.3 credits for my one acre of wetland impact. Now, how many sand skate, how many panther credits? What, how does that work? Well, 
relatively easy, especially for the sand skink and the scrub jay. You need two credits for every acre of impact. Therefore, if sand skink credits are $20,000 a credit, you need to purchase $40,000 for every acre of impact. Same thing with the scrub jay. Now the panther is a little bit more complex. You have to do some very uh, intricate calculation, but the approximate amount per acre of uh, panther uh, habitat per acre is about seven PHUs, and that's the panther habitat unit. Gopher tortoises. They are not regulated as far as um, mitigating it to a conservation bank. They are, um, they're not regulated by U.S. Fish and Wildlife, they're regulated by Florida, and therefore they actually relocate the, the gopher tortoise to a recipient site. And a gopher tortoise agent uh, who is licensed will be able to facilitate that removal um, of the species. Prior, uh, probably around 2006, before they did this transition, they would actually pave over the gopher tortoises for their project. So thank goodness they woke up and they started relocating them. Okay, species conservation bank. Unlike mitigation banking, which is really restoration, species bank is a lot about preservation. Now you can do restoration as well, but preservation is really the main ingredient. Putting the conservation easement on it, controlling the exotic plants, and facilitating all the natural revegetation. And like I said before, all credits are awarded up front. So that's great. Here's um, the Sand Skink Conservation Bank service area. This is the Lake Wales Ridge in Florida. And uh, any uh, project, uh, any uh, land that is located within this purple corridor can be serviced by any Sand Skink Conservation Bank in Florida. They all have the same service area. They make it easy. And here's the Panther. Conservation Bank service area. As you can see, there's a primary and a secondary zone. They really like to focus on that primary zone, um, but that is the service area um, in the uh, Southwest Florida um, area. Okay, let's talk a little bit about administrative policies and barriers. So as you all know, we've had um, some really big things happen, uh, of course, with the new WOTUS rule. And as you know, it will limit the extent of federal regulation. There will be less federal uh, mitigation needed, uh, such as uh, inferior streams and isolated wetlands and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. However, places like Florida, New Jersey, and Michigan, we are lucky because we have state oversight anyway. So although it affects us, it's not gonna affect us as much as it does in Texas. Um, because we have that state oversight. And um, to make things even more complicated, if you're not in Florida, we just um, approved the Florida Assumption. So basically, the Clean Water Act, Section 404, was all transferred. I think this happened, it was either December or January of this year. Um, it all transferred from the Army Corps of Engineers to the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. So all 404 permits will now be permitted by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. So that's really interesting. So if you have an ERP, you still go with the state, the water management districts, but if you federal, you're gonna go with DEP. Now, the projects that are really benefiting from this or will benefit once this program's in implementation, we're only three months in or so, well, I guess four or five now, but anyway, um, it's definitely a learning curve that they are getting over. And I asked this morning, I haven't got a response back from DEP, has the first 404 permit been issued by DEP yet? I think they're close, but I'm not sure. Um, regardless, um, mitigation banks will still be permitted under the core. But um, what I was saying before, I lost my train of thought, is if you are a single family homeowner, uh, linear project, uh, energy, you can go to DEP for your state permit. So that's the people that are really going to be streamlined because they got their state and their federal permitting both being done by DEP. So that should be great for those kind of projects and uh, not have to have two different agencies review. The other barrier to entry is permitting. And I say this is a double-edged sword because it's really good for the people in, but it's not so good for the people out. It's kind of like being in the clique in high school. Once you're in, you're in. 
but it is hard to get in. And so basically, um, if you're a mitigation bank, um, you're kind of happy that it takes four to seven years or whatever it might be to get a permit. Uh, but when you're in the, in the trenches and trying to get a permit, you don't like it so much. So anyways, that's a huge barrier to entry, which could be a good or bad thing for this industry. All right, strategies of credit sales. Um, you know, everybody has their own um, uh, success story and their secrets. Um, I've been selling credits my whole career for 16 years. It's all I know. And um, what I have learned, the most successful way to sell credits is to establish relationships with landowners, with environmental consultants, with um, you know developers, with other regulators. Relationships matter and people wanna do business with people they trust. In addition, being efficient, um, being quick. You know, um, I know some mitigation bankers that it takes a week to get a call back. And then it takes another week to get an agreement. And we don't want to play that game. We want it quick. And as far as I'm concerned, we want it as efficient as possible to make the environmental consultants look as good as possible because we're on it. They don't have to keep asking us for it. We're on it. We're quick. We're efficient. We get things done the same day. And also knowledgeable. You got you to gotta be knowledgeable in this industry. One of my new favorite quotes is, you can't microwave experience. And ain't that the truth? Uh, sometimes you got to go through all the pitfalls to understand uh, what you're doing and have some success stories. Uh, also, in addition, out of the box thinking. Uh, for example, if someone calls and they need uh, forested credits and I only have herbaceous credits, I'm not going to say, sorry, call, call my competitor. No, 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 no. You're going to say, do you think that we could show an aerial that will show that this wetland was, you know, forested, herbaceous, whatever we need it to be back in the 50s or 60s so we can prove it? Yeah, I think, yes, absolutely. It was a forest and a herbaceous wetland back in the 50s or 60s. All right, great. Talk to your reviewer and see if they will approve forested versus herbaceous. Also, and those are the two main types uh, in Florida, herbaceous, forested. I know they're different in all different regions. Um, and uh, in addition, out of basin. I don't have a mitigation bank in this basin. Uh, no one does. And so what do we do? We go to the next space and over and we get a cumulative impact assessment like I was talking about. So you never throw away business, you never let it go. And um, uh, the most important thing is explain this effort pro uh, process effortlessly because you are gonna get calls from people that like I'm sure most people on this phone are very educated and understand, but you're also gonna get that single family homeowner who doesn't even know what a wetland is. He purchased the property, he didn't know there was wetlands on it. What do I do? So you gotta be able to really um, explain the process very simplistically so that they can understand the process to move forward or not. And then, very important as well, keep accurate and detailed information about every single project. Someone like me is working on a hundred different projects at the same time, and I would get confused if I didn't, you know, type it all out and have a spreadsheet that shows every single thing I do. February 22nd, 2021, I sent the agreement. February 27th, 2021, I, um, I followed up on the agreement, you know? On uh, March 1st, 2021, we received the deposit and signed agreement. On March 2nd, 2021, I sent back the signed agreement. I mean, every single meticulous little thing. Uh, March 15th, 2021, I sent an email to follow up to find out the status of the permit. Everything. Everything, everything, everything. And so uh, being able to accurately know every single bit of information on that project without having to go back in the file and figure out all this stuff, have it right there at your fingertips and it'll make it so much easier and get you so much more organized. You can do that on something as simple as Excel, like I do, or you can get something more sophisticated like Salesforce or another CPM that would be wonderful for your follow up. Okay, best practice is for credit ledgers. Um, you know, uh, pretty simple goes without saying, but uh, some tricks that I've learned through experience is, of course, maintaining an internal credit, res uh, credit ledger for both state and federal agencies. 
and put the pending reservation so you know exactly how many credits you have to sell. Because if you mess up and you don't account for 0.01 credits and now you're sold out, you have 0.01 credit uh, issue. Uh, so it's very, very, very important to make sure that your ledger is accurate and that you keep it um, like an audit with the state and federal agencies. I'll give you an example. Last week, I sent um, one of the water management districts a uh, transfer document. And when they sent it to me as completed with the new ledger, it didn't have a project that I deducted the month before. And I had that ledger. Well, anyways, I contacted them. Something got messed up in their database. I don't know. But things like that need to be looked at because if I didn't find that, it could have been missing. It could have, it could have not been deducted. And now those credits don't have a home because I didn't follow up. They made a mistake, whatever it might be. Also, your internal spreadsheet, you might have some errors. Have the mitigation bank or a third party oversee it, have an audit because it is so important to have an accurate ledger. I can't tell you enough. And, um, and the most important thing as far as credit ledger is as soon as those permits are issued, as soon as you have the full balance, go ahead and deduct the credits as soon as possible. Not only is it wrap things up for you, but it makes it easier on the buyer of the mitigation credits to just say, okay, we're done. The process is complete and I don't have to wait on them anymore. We're done. So get them in, get them out as soon as possible so that you can work on the next project. Okay, best practices for mitigation conservation credit sales agreements. You know, you can do it anyway. You can have a one page agreement, you can have a 20 page agreement. Uh, it's all up to you. The way that we do it down here, uh, uh, majority of the time, especially uh, my mitigation banks, 10% non-refundable deposit, reserves the credit for 90 days. You sign an agreement that will give you a reservation. I'll send you a reservation letter that says, you got one credit reserved at Lake X Mitigation Bank uh, for this specific project with their pro permit number. Um, and if they need an extension because their permit hasn't been issued after the 90 days, we can provide another 10% deposit non-refundable uh, to extend. And of course, you want to be flexible with them. If they need, you know, more time, if they need um, a credit discount and they have, you know, a large amount of credits needed, things like that, you want to be accommodating. It's very important. Data collection, integration with Ribbits. Oh my goodness, Ribbits is so resourceful. What did we do without it? It, if you don't know about it, it provides all the mitigation and conservation banks throughout the country. Not only does it include the ledgers that show every single project that's been deducted with their permit number, it also shows how many credits each bank has available, how many credits each bank, how many banks, or how many credits each bank has sold. Uh, so you can figure out absorption so quickly and mark it if you want to enter it, you want to look at your competitor, or you want to just look at your own bank. Uh, also has all the contact information in there, so you can call whoever is doing the credit sales or the mitigation banker. Also under cyber respi respiratory, uh, it has all the permitting documents. You can find the credit releases, the MBI. I mean, it's just amazing. And here in Florida, the five different water management districts and DEP also keep uh, a database kind of like Ribbits, Ribbits that shows the ledger and all the different information for mitigation banks. So very transparent. That wasn't always the case. Um, you would have to do a FOIA request or find out all this information to look at uh, the permits and, and um, the ledgers and different things like that. Now it's just all at our fingertips. So um, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. Okay. And um, we're about done here, so we'll start taking questions if there are any, but this is kind of the wrap up. Um, we've already discussed this, but which mitigation bank, which conservation bank, you know, what do I do? What, how, do if, how do I find out which one services my property? Well, if you don't have something like um, what I have on my website where you can see right here, um, you put in your address, you put in a cross street, and it will tell you exactly what basin that you're located in. And before I had this tool, I was lost because I would have environmental consultants call me that are very, very knowledgeable about the industry, but they would say, here's the address, what basin am I in? So I have to figure it out. I can't rely on the landowner, the environmental consultant, or the engineer to determine which basin are you in so I can figure out what services you. No, you gotta figure out which basin are they in? 
which mitigation banks service the area. And even though it says that all these banks service it, are they all in this that in that basin? Or if you went to those banks, would a cumulative impact assessment be required? So you need to know, you know, a little bit more of the gritty than just the surface layer. Um, and of course, every mitigation bank has different pricing. Uh, in Florida, it ranges on the UMAM level of 100,000 to 400,000 a credit. Um, the uh, availability, you know, you need to find out what the current availability is if you have a due diligence project. You know, is there two credits left or are there 200? And the type of credits, you know, we talked about forested first herbaceous and uh, saltwater credit, whatever it might be. Uh, you need to make sure that you have the right type of credit for the right type of impact. And of course, like we said, the most important thing to me is what is the quality of your wetland? Are you low, average, or high? Because that's going to determine how many credits you need per acre of impact. So there we go. Um, I'll take questions or any discussion if we have any. Great. Well, thank you so much, Victoria. That was a fantastic overview of the Florida market and techniques to sell. And I, I apologize for the disruption. You recovered very well. I've been there. I know it's, I know how hard that is. Um, so we don't have, just looking at the chat box, we don't have anything coming up in the chat box. But I'll, I mean, I've got a few questions if I can start. Let's do it. So I love rivets too. I think it's an amazing tool. And I'm just curious, um, are you required to upload data to Ribbis for transactions within a certain time period? So you mean as far as the permitting activities or the ledger updates, or what are you referring to? Everything, yeah, ledger updates, the permitting activity, like what's the requirement for updating Ribbis? Yeah, so the agencies do that as far as, okay. the, as, far as the wetlands are concerned they process all that information uh, internally. But for the conservation banks, it's different. You actually go in and manipulate the system and deduct the credits. Um, so um, yes, I mean, you of course wanna do that um, as soon as possible as far as deducting the credits. But as far as the wetlands are concerned, um, Army Corps of Engineers or the state agencies, they will, um, deduct the credits and they will submit all the information on their cyber respiratory link. Anytime they get it, they're supposed to upload it. Great, great. All right, thank you for that. Um, I, I was always curious. So I've got a, one question here from uh, Robert Spoth. Is there any difference between the endowment requirement in a mitigation bank and endowment requirement in a species bank? Say it again. Is is there a difference between endowment on a wetland and a species bank? Yeah, since one in the Florida DEP and the other one is in the WMD. Oh, Bob, you're throwing me a hard one. But this is Bob's specialty. He's just asking because he already knows the answer. Um, so, is there a different endowment with mitigation wetland mitigation versus species? Uh, yes, it's com it's completely different. Are you talking about the financial assurances, Bob? I'm assuming. Yes. Um, yeah, just the um, just the um, endowment part. I, you are right; it is me. But actually, I don't know the answer because I don't know anything about species banking. <laughs> I'm learning. Okay. Yeah. To tell you the truth, I don't know either. That would be an environmental consultant question, as far as how much financial assurances would need to be put up. But I think it's all case by case basis, based off of the different specifics of each uh, property slash bank. Yeah, I just meant the endowment. The endowment half of it, like there has to be a big trust thing involved and all that. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm actually not certain. That's a great question. I'll look into that and, and email you, Bob. Okay, great. Another question here from Surreal Perez. And um, so he, this question probably isn't um, as germane to this talk, uh, but maybe some folks could reach out to uh, Mr. Perez and help him. But he's, he's a new environmental consulting firm and he wants to know where to advertise to to work on wetland ecology. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll address that separately in an email to you, um, but let's move on to Chuck Walker. What criteria do you evaluate when selecting a location for a bank? Uh, what's the typical timeframe for, for bank permitting start to finish? 
Okay, so location, location, location. It's so important, just like any kind of real estate deal. If you're over in the Disney area, you're gonna have large, large absorption versus in the panhandle where there's not too much development as of yet. And so basically you really need to evaluate the market. You need to know what the existing players are, how many competitors you know, will you have, the pricing. And as far as um, figuring out what location to go in, you just need to, like I said, evaluate the absorption for the other mitigation banks that are currently in the market. Now, if there isn't any mitigation banks currently in a drainage basin, it's um, it's an interesting situation because it's hard for you to evaluate how many credits you are anticipated to sell, but uh, it's a, a real win-win because you are the only mitigation bank and uh, you'll set the pricing and whatever projects are within that basin you're gonna get. And I'll give you an example, Neo Verde Mitigation Bank, which <clears throat> I sold two years ago. Um, it was in a basin over in Basin 21, St. John's over kind of by Cocoa Beach. And there was never a bank uh, there. And so when they were, we were trying to sell it. So it was like, how do we tell people that it's gonna sell 10 credits a year when we have no data? So we looked at, you know, what did they do as far as offsite mitigation prior to a mitigation bank? So we were looking into that, digging into that, you know, looking at different areas surrounding that base and what their prices are at. Well, we sold it and two years after the bank was implemented, they got all their money back. They sold all the credits because Blue Origin and SpaceX and everybody needed all these credits. So, I mean, it was a real success story. So it really is determined on where the project is located. You wanna know what development is slated, roadways, everything like that. So very, very important to find out location um, and what that basin uh, will bring currently and for the future. Great, great. So uh, I've got a follow-up comment from Greg DeYoung to Bob Spoth, uh, Bob Spoth's question about uh, long-term funding the endowment. Yes. And Greg's highlighting that species long-term funding is similar to wetland bank long-term funding. Um, Customers banks can easily require much more money than mitigation banks for long-term management. Okay. I'm sure you've seen that there as well, Victoria. Wonderful. All right, another question here is, what is the suggested acre that can be considered for a mitigation bank? Is there a minimum size for um, yeah. for, for species such as the uh, sand skink? Um, there's not a minimum size, but I think the smallest might be, well, I think there was a conservation bank that might have been 77 acres. So, you know, the bigger the better, of course, but I would say 70 acres. Okay, great. I'm going to throw in another question here in, in between. Um, so the, the species program in Florida seems very straightforward. And so you use a lot of preservation banks. I'm just curious, are you seeing more of a move towards restoration as areas for preservation go away? Is that happening in the, in the market? For the species, for the habitat conservation? Right. It's case by case basis, you know, I mean, the, the conservation bank can just do preservation or they could also implement restoration activities for more credits. Um, of course, that's going to be a, a additional expense, but there'll be additional rewards. So you really can uh, decide on how you want to um, do that. If you just want the low hanging fruit or if you really want to um, restore this property. So you can you can do it either way. Great. So at this point, I'd like to invite folks if they want to unmute and ask questions. And so while we transition there, I'll ask one more question. Okay. So I'm also curious, so the species program in, what, in uh, Florida is very straightforward. And I'm curious, are there, does the state do program evaluation in terms of looking at to be success? Do they do like every five, 10 years? Any experience there? That's a great question. I'm not sure. I don't know how they manage that. Um, I, I do know I contacted U.S. Fish and Wildlife this morning just to prepare for this presentation. And I asked them, I said, is there any additional species that we're gearing up to mitigate for, like the bonnet bat or whatever it might be? And they said, they are so slammed right there now, they can't even think that far in advance. Uh, but you never know how things will be next year. But um, Currently, I'm not sure how, how they rate the success 
Uh, that's a great question that I, I do not know. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Just trying to, you know, I guess. Um, a good question. A measuring stick to evaluate programs. Uh, you know, thinking forward in time in terms of you know what what can we learn from Florida in terms of putting good policy forward. Right. I know that the Panther they um, anticipated like to have thirty by this time, and now we're at like between one hundred and two hundred. So we're yeah. obviously we're obviously doing something right. That's great. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So just creating some space here on Zoom for questions. And, and let me get back to Mr. Perez's question because um, I do consider myself kind of an expert in marketing and, and welcome to the environmental industry. Um, Mr. Perez, uh, marketing yourself is uh, a, uh, a new known talent online and doing um, any kind of exposure is wonderful. You can go, you know, as crazy as pay-per-click or SEO with your website. You can do YouTube videos explaining the process, just getting as much, much exposure and explaining what you can do um, is, is the most beneficial. And, and relationships matter. Great, yeah, all right. So here's, a, here's another comment from Evan. Shelly, what are the um, approximate total costs associated with taking wetlands, assume 70 acres, and turning it into a mitigation bank uh, over the course of the two to seven year that it takes to establish? Okay, so with the wetland mitigation banks, the smallest uh, is about 150 acres. The largest in Florida is about 23,000. So they say about an average is about 600 to 800, maybe even 1,000 acres for mitigation banks in Florida. But as far as expenses, it's a great, Great question. Um, not only are you going to have to buy the land, unless you have a joint venture with the landowner, but you're going to have to do permitting, which could cost uh, approximately $300,000. If you need an engineer for the hydrology, that could be another $100,000. Uh, if you have legal, you know, that could be another $50,000. So there's a lot of different expenses that come into play before you can even start selling your credits. And then you have the short-term and the long-term financial assurances. And if you don't understand that really quickly, you have to put up 110% of your construction costs. So if you have $100,000 of construction costs that you are, going to, uh, you, you, you are going to spend over the next five years to restore this property back to its natural state, you gotta propose only say 100,000, which is really low, but we're just using that as an example. You have to put $110,000 into a bank account to ensure that you have those funds to be able to do these activities. Once you pay your contractor, you submit that and they'll release the funds. So you're paying double, but you do get it back. Now the long-term financial assurances, which Bob Spock was talking about with the endowment, that is different. And, um, and, and that's determined case by case basis on acreage and all the different things. Uh, but you may have to put a million dollars into a long-term trust fund um, and they anticipate that the interest off of the, that, those funds will help maintain the property in perpetuity long after you and I are gone. So um, it's a very expensive, um, like I said, high barrier to entry as far as the investment, uh, but the long-term investment is great, but it you know could take 10 to 20 years to sell out. So, it's, um, it's definitely a very interesting uh, model. Victoria and, and Doug, this is Greg DeYoung. I don't know if you can hear me. Hi. Hi, uh, Victoria, I really like the way you answered that question. And uh, of course, part of it is it's, it's so dependent on the habitat types and how much restoration and so forth. But it, I would only add that it can easily be several millions of dollars you know, in total for, you know, I think it, it sometimes can be 10 or $15 million, depending on what you're, what you're trying to do on the site and how large and so forth. And I would also add that sometimes we've seen, and, and Victoria, I'm sure you've seen this too, but we, we sometimes will see a landowner or, or sometimes even a consultant who they seem to equate the cost of the credits with the acreage of the land. And so we, we, we see a lot of misunderstanding out there. So if a, if a credit costs a lot of money, say 
half million dollars, just as an example, or quarter million dollars, then sometimes, unfortunately, that'll create a lot of confusion where a landowner will just multiply that against the number of acres they have. And they say, oh my gosh, I'm sitting on a pot of gold. <laughs> maybe they are, maybe they're not. But uh, it, a lot of it depends on how much will each site, how many credits will that site generate? It might only be a very small fraction, 10% perhaps of the total parcel size. And so that's, we've seen that there's a lot of misunderstanding surrounding how the sort of those, uh, the gross acreage relates to uh, net revenue. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And there are a lot of misconceptions, and I'll, I'll tell you a couple more, but just to piggyback on that, in Florida, and I'm not sure how it is in the rest of the country, but average, I've seen seven acre acres equal one credit, and it could be more or less. Now, if you're doing off-site mitigation, you might need 10 to 20 acres per acre of impact. Um, Another uh, misconception that a lot of people have is I have uh, 30 acres and I'd like to deposit these acres, this land into a mitigation bank. And I'm like, it's not how it works. But you know, you would think so. I want to deposit my land into a bank. The, uh, a lot of people don't realize that these mitigation banks, like we've been talking about, take two to seven years to get permitted. And to be able to modify it and add additional land would be a huge uh, endeavor. And you don't even want to do that unless it's adjacent. So um, a lot of people that have 30 acres of wetlands, they don't know what to do with it. And they think that it's valuable to a mitigation bank. I tell them, you know, I don't know if there's any answers. Um, I'm not sure what it's good for. So I, I, I completely understand what you're, where you're, what you're saying. Well, thank you so much, Greg, for that comment. And um, we're running a little short on time here, but we had one more comment on the chat, uh, again, from Evan Shelley. Just want to know a bit, I think you discussed this a bit, but what kind of construction is needed with the wetlands? I'm sorry, what kind of construction? Correct. It could be a wide variety of activities, you know, low water crossing, um, uh, different activities involving, you know, removing the exotic species, it, putting the, the native species in there, uh, lots of different restoration activities to be able to generate credits. Great. So I feel like that's a good place to, to stop, unless there, there are more questions. Um, thank you so much, Victoria, for that very comprehensive talk. And I uh, really appreciate you um, uh, contributing to the format and uh, look forward to having you guys come and, and sign up again in the future. The next talk is gonna be by Jake Lee of the Environmental Policy Innovation Center, talking about their recommendations to the Biden administration for future species crediting programs. So please tune back in in a month and I'll send out those notifications. Again, Victoria, thank you so much. And we'll see you guys next time. Thank you so much and happy Earth Day to all of you. And uh, as everyone else is saying, treat every day like Earth Day. And I know you do. I hear that, thank you. Thank you guys. Bye.